Now, it's been almost three years since Jonathan Pollard arrived in Israel. After serving 30 years in U.S. prisons for providing Israel with top secret information gleaned while serving in U.S. naval intelligence, Pollard has kept a relatively low profile since then. He says he's refused office to enter politics, but in recent months has spoken out more on some issues, such as his recent advocacy on behalf of a Jewish terrorist convicted of the arson murder of a Palestinian family. Pollard joined me recently in studio to discuss that case, his feelings about Israel and the U.S., and questions on anti-Semitism and dual loyalty raised by his own dramatic story. Jonathan Pollard, thank you for joining us on I-24 News and Jewish World Weekly. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Right. First of all, your first time in the studio, I just want to ask you about your life here in Israel now a little, I think, two and, uh, yes. Uh, almost three years. Almost three years now. Uh, how have you adjusted? How do you see your life here? Um, I've told many people that uh, when I came here, um, I was shocked that the country I thought I was sacrificing my life before didn't actually exist. It existed in my mind, in my heart, but not in reality. And Esther, my, my wife at the time... Uh, right, who has passed away. Who had, may she uh, rest in peace, yes. shalom, uh, immediately stopped me and said, who did you serve? Did you serve a government? Did you serve a political faction? Did you serve a politician? Who did you serve? And I thought about it, and I said, the land and people of Israel. And she said, they didn't abandon you. Governments are all the same. Uh, they use people like you and dispose of them. But the land and the people don't. Right. But so you're talking about your reception here by Israelis, your encounter when you meet Correct. Israelis. Correct. It's a little overwhelming for me because I am a very kind of reticent guy to begin with. You wouldn't believe that, but I've had to become a little bit more extroverted since coming here. And um, you have to, I have to remember the, the main issue here with a lot of people is that they're thankful that somebody actually thought enough about them to risk their life. Um, so, I, I'm thankful for their reception of me. Um, it's, it's a wonderful experience for them and for me both. Um, so that part of my experience has been very positive. As far as my relationship to the governments, plural, um, are concerned, it's been less enjoyable, I'll put it that way. I, there are a lot of people within the security and intelligence establishment in Israel that are very unhappy that I lived long enough to come home. Mm -hmm. And having come home, they're very, very uh, reluctant to actually accept me as a full-blooded citizen. They kind of put me off to mm -hmm. the side, don't talk to me, treat me with incredible disrespect. And it's, it's their treatment of me stands in marked contrast to the kind of reception I've received from the people, from the army. Um. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you about the country that you've, you've left, the United States, your feelings about that, about the U.S. Uh, about the U.S. It was the country that I was born in. Uh, I'm a Texan by birth. Uh, and I guess I still am. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that I committed the crime and that the use of my use by certain elements within the U.S. government to kind of collectively punish the Jewish community was something that was really extraordinary. A lot of people don't realize that in my indictment, it states very clearly that I provided Israel with classified information without intent to harm the United States. That's been completely forgotten. Intent plays a very important role in a conviction. Um, I think you'll agree that there is some information that is so sensitive that it should never be compromised to anybody, regardless of how close they are to the United States. Because it could, if compromised, inflict incalculable damage on the United States national security. If I had done that, I should have been charged with intent to harm the United States because I should have known 
that my actions would result in damage to the United States. So I try to tell people, if you just look at my indictment, you can kind of deduce that all the hype surrounding the damage that was right. alleged it just is I, but I, The question Jonathan raises is why didn't you just get on a plane when you saw that, when you realized the information that you say the U.S. was uh, withholding from Israel right. fighter school? Why don't you just get on the next plane to Israel and, and make out? I considered that. I considered uh, going to people on Capitol Hill and explaining to them in camera what I'd witnessed and what was going on, namely this undeclared intelligence embargo. But I considered that um, a cowardly act on my part. It wasn't, it, it wasn't sufficient for me to simply say, throw up my hands and say, okay, something horrible is happening and I just have to leave and go to Israel and suffer the consequences along with everybody else. Look, I grew Do you regret not doing that, I guess no, I'm asking? No, no, no. I'll tell you why. I grew up in a household where I had an uncle from Germany. He was uh, on a voyage of the damned. One of the few people that survived from his extended family. And he was refused entry. And um, he emphasized to me over and over again my principal responsibility to hold myself in readiness to defend Jews anywhere at whatever cost. Again, I understand that he was abandoned terribly by both family members and uh, business members of his father's uh, outer circle, economic circle, right. in New York. So I grew up with this notion of personal accountability for Jews. We'll have more on this interview with Jonathan Pollard after the break. Welcome back to Jewish World Weekly, and let's get back to our interview with Jonathan Pollard, the American Jewish spy who spent 30 years in U.S. jails for leaking top intelligence secrets to Israel. How do you react to those who still hold you up, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, as a kind of a symbol of, of dual loyalty, a charge that, you know, if we look what you see what's happening in the United States in recent years, a surge in anti-Semitism, uh, uh, and the loyalties of American Jews being questioned? Okay. First of all, I think this is, this is important to, I guess, uh, appreciate. I've never denied the existence of dual loyalty. Um, I suffered from it. And it was a mistake for me not to make Aliyah. From uh, long before I joined the intelligence community in the United States. That was my principal mistake. I should have come home. Number two... Um, basically, we believe that a person should be convicted and prosecuted as, as an individual. We don't believe in the United States of collective punishment, but that's what happened to me. One of the reasons why I, I have 100% disability now is because I refused to implicate a whole raft of American Jewish leaders in my activities. And these were people, many of whom were saying pretty horrible things about me at the time. But again, I was raised in a family not to be Moser, another Jew, no matter who that person Jew was. So um, I'm 100% disabled because of that. There have been Jewish leaders who have come to me since my release and have said, um, we understand now having been briefed by people in the know what happened to you and why you refuse to implicate us in your activities. The fact of the matter is when you have the chairman, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff admitting openly that my sentence was intended to intimidate American Jews into understanding that they have one loyalty and one loyalty alone. Right. And this is why one of the main points I was making is, accuse me of dual loyalty, fine. But what I was trying to emphasize throughout the 35 years that I was in the United States, post, you know, in, right. in, in prison and post-release, uh, was a dual system of justice. Not dual loyalty, but dual justice. Right. If you actually believe that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the promise that President Washington made at the Turo Synagogue 
right. back in the 1790s, that we would be treated as equal citizens in the United States had any merit, then you shouldn't feel uncomfortable with what I did because you would trust the American judicial system. So what does that say about, in your view, about the position of Jews in American U.S. society, even in this day? There is nothing unique about the American galut. Just like every other galut that we've experienced, whether it was in Germany or Spain or anywhere else for that matter, there comes, we will always be suspect and there will always come a point in time where that suspicion kind of rises to the level of an accusation and persecution. Well, you know, there are many American Jews who would take issue with that, but we won't go into oh, it. Oh, I'm well aware of that I, fact. But, uh, but I do want to ask you, do you have any desire to visit the U.S. anymore? Is that possibility? It's the it's, land it's, of your birth, or, or, or you, it's, it's not possible under the conditions? In the I would think it would be ill-advised for me to go home okay. to the United States. Okay. Or go back to the United States. Right. Um, because anything could happen. Right. Um, they're still not finished with me. What does that mean? I want to. What does that mean? They're still not finished. I want to ask you. You actually applied for a gun. It was well publicized. You applied right. for a gun permit in Israel. Initially, were denied by the government. The current national security minister, Edom Mark Van Veer, uh, apparently uh, saw things uh, differently. Saw things different. Got you a gun license. I believe you're wearing a gun now. Correct. Why, why? Why do you feel you need a gun in the streets of Israel, Jonathan? Well, first of all, uh, police can't be everywhere, and. Let me first say... I mean, why do you personally feel well, that? Not let, why let, general is... I, I understand that, but let me just make it clear. I hope to God I never use this gun. However, why do I personally need yeah. it? Okay, because the U.S. attorney that prosecuted me, Joey DeGeneva, was kind enough at my sentencing to reveal the fact that I was the Israeli intelligence officer that helped put together the Israeli Air Force raid on the PLO headquarters in Tunis in the fall of 1985. About 90 members of Force 17, Arafat, then Arafat's personal bodyguard, uh, were killed in that raid. Arafat was the target. All right, so you feel you could be a target of Palestine? No, I know it is because uh, the propaganda out of Ramallah right. uh, is, cons is harping on, the, they call me the butcher of Tunis. Right. And, you know, I don't like it when pictures of me on the street appear in PA propaganda publications. Right. Or pictures of my wife. Right. And my children. Right. That has a, that concerns me quite a bit. So I have to be able to, and I'm in the territories also quite a bit, uh, giving speeches and visiting well, places. Well, let me ask you about giving speeches, and you have a following among a certain political element in Israeli society. Have you been approached to be a member, uh, to join a political party, uh, 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 even as a, as a Knesset member or in some faction, well, and what's your response to that? I, when I, I wasn't in the country five hours when someone came to me and said, you know, we're going to give you the number five position. You want to say who that is? No, I, I really, okay. I shouldn't. But I think people can kind of cotton out what, okay. who that person was. And I just said, no, I'm, I'm not prepared for that. I had a very sick wife at the time who was dying. And my principal responsibility was to take care of her. She spent 30, almost 30 years taking care of me. And now it was my time to step up and take care of her. That was my exclusive responsibility at the time. I, during the last election, I woke up one Friday morning and found out that I was part of another political party. And I was kind of horrified by that because while I give freely of my advice, political advice, to any number of political parties, I didn't join any at that time. And so I had to very politely um, redu eliminate that possibility by saying I've suffered enough which everybody laughed at. They thought that was funny, but what wasn't published was the second part of that, which was having said that, 
I admit that I'm probably the most appropriate uh, person for the Knesset because I've already been to prison. Okay, well, that's a good line. <laughs> so, well, even though you're not a politician, you've made headlines this year with some of your statements. Some have been very criticized. Your comment about uh, the uh, Hawara, the West Bank town, after two Israelis uh, were shot there and Correct. seeming to agree with the comments, it should be it should be leveled. Uh, now you have taken up an advocacy position for Amiram Ben Uliel, who is right. the Israeli who was convicted. Uh, of uh, taking part in the murder of three Palestinians, including a, uh, an infant, child. really, a child, and advocating for, for, for his release or easing of his conditions. Why would you take, take such positions? There are three principal reasons why. And my approach to Amiram is, has been formed in large okay. part by my own personal experiences with a criminal justice system in the United States that was totally corrupt. So there are three principal reasons why I'm now stepped right. into the limelight to advocate on his behalf. Number one, his lawyers were never allowed to introduce exculpatory documents or exculpatory evidence before the high court on bank. And that was refused by Esther Hayut, which I find... Okay, I don't want to go so much in details. You well, criticize the... Yes, but there are yes, the, 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 the three yeah. reasons. There are three reasons. That's number one. Number two torture was used to extract his confession, and that torture was justified and legalized by the high court. First of all, we all know that confessions from torture are not credible because the, the person making the confession will say and do anything. I, I, I understand, I, but you are making criticisms that some of Israel's opponents and enemies have said and criticized over his treatment of Palestinians. Are Correct. you standing up for the right of, of those Palestinians I agree. who have received similar treatment? Correct, and that's why when people ask me, and I've been asked by reporters, oh, this is just okay. a concern for Jews. And I've said, no, I don't believe that torture should be used indiscriminately especially for Jews, Arabs, uh, Muslims, Circassians, Druze, Bedouins. I don't accept the use of torture for anybody. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it at that for time uh, limitations. Jonathan Pollard, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. On the 24 News. Thank you.